on unproven allegations of illegal drug activity. So it's even more than, you know, what was first put into place with the RICO Act. Now, if you just, if someone says, oh, I think this person bought it, uh, you know, their with house drug with drug money, um, they can take it. The object is pretty explicitly, the rationale is that, well, if you were selling drugs, that we don't want you to be able to use the profits from your drugs to buy a defense attorney. Of course, so we have to get you before you're right. convicted, and yet you're not guilty yet. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, and who whose property are they going after? Right? The poorest people. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah. people of color. Not, you know, the people in the white suburbs of big cities. Not um, Sandusky, yeah. who got out on a uh, easy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, and uh, we all know that it isn't because there isn't drug use going on in the white suburbs, wealthy white suburbs. <laughs> um, Reagan bribed police departments to make drug enforcement a priority. They offered millions of dollars of federal aid. They offered DA agents to come and train the police officers. They had intelligence and technical support to state highway agencies. The Pentagon gave military equipment um, and intelligence, millions of dollars in firepower to state and local agencies to get them to make this rhetoric of the war on drugs a reality. I mean, it's frightening. They would, get the, you know, that's where the SWAT teams came from. All of the federal training, the paramilitary style of policing came from all of this money that was funneled in to get the pl police departments to buy into this because it wasn't obvious to them to, to make this a priority. Well, that kind of lines up with the militarization of our police forces. As right. Well. It, that's no exactly what it was. Protection officers, they're being, they're being armed and outfitted as if they're going into combat in Iraq. Yeah. yeah. Which they I mean, are. Better. Yeah. Yeah. Well, part of it, part Hiring of it too. Of they are. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't only the war on drugs. I mean, part of that came from the riots in the 19, uh, late 1960s, um, when the police departments didn't know what to do when there were protests, and so. Um, again, they were trained by the military to react um, with force, and we know what happened. Um, so as a result of this, the number of arrests for drugs skyrocketed, and so did the number of felons. Um, oh, in addition to all this uh, list of horrors that I, we've been talking about that can happen after you um, have a felony conviction, they also take your children away. Right. Um, one more little, little yeah. problem. <laughs> um, White youth um, are three times more likely to use drugs than minority youth. They've done studies, they've done surveys, but of course, white youth are rarely arrested. 80 to 90 percent of those arrested for drugs are African Americans, although studies show consistently that African Americans are no more likely to use drugs um, than whites. Um, drug wars could have been waged in white communities on college campuses, for instance, <laughs> high school lacrosse players who are known for hosting coke and ecstasy parties. Um, they could have taken the televisions and the furniture and the cash from the fraternity houses based on an anonymous tip that there's a joint in someone's... Um, oh, I just aged myself, didn't I? <laughs> and, um, uh, dresser. And, um, you know, but they didn't. They concentrated on looking for drugs in places where there's high concentrations of poor blacks with uh, little to no political power. Um, so Alexander argues in the book that when the system of mass incarceration collapses, and she says that if history is any guide, it will, right? Each system eventually gets to the point where it can no longer sustain itself. It will be replaced with something else if history is any guide, um, right? And we may be seeing that, although I don't think so yet, but. Um, there just were a few hints when they started saying that California had to release a bunch of its prisoners because they ran out of room, right? And there's nowhere else to put them. So you see maybe the start of this unraveling, but it's still going strong. Um, but she argues that historians will undoubtedly look back and marvel that such an extraordinary comprehensive system 
of racialized social control existed in, in the United States. I'm quoting here. How fascinating, they will say, that a drug war was rage, waged almost exclusively against poor people of color, people already trapped in ghettos that lacked jobs and decent schools, rounded up by millions, packed away in prisons, and then released, stigmatized for life, and saddled with thousands of dollars of debt, and shamed and condemned for failing to hold their families together, and chastised for succumbing to depression and anger, and being blamed for landing back in prison. She writes, historians <coughs> would likely wonder how we could describe the new caste system as a system of crime control, when it is difficult to imagine a system better designed to create rather than prevent crime. <laughs> I don't think this is nitpicking, but <laughs> I kind of disagreed with what you said about 1970s and going into the 80s as being when drugs became a big deal because I kind of think that, especially in oppressed communities, that drugs and alcohol have been used to sedate uh, or try, you know, kind, kind of like, whoa, whoa. you know, that that rather than rebel, you know, like the places where there's the most liquor stores are in the most exploitative uh, industries are. Yeah. Well, I was trying to, you know, the whole gamut uh, during World uh, during the Vietnam War. You know, at the same time that they were fighting, the CIA had its own airline to transport drugs into the United States Heroin to in try, that, no. yes, to try and pacify pop. what was seemingly something that okay. was getting out of control. Oh. Right. So it isn't that drug use became a big deal in the 70s and 80s. We've had drug use All always, history. right? But this is it's white. That, it's that this is when the federal agencies and the you know the uh, federal the presidents and their administrations started to focus on this and say we're going to use this. That's when this system of mass incarceration starts, and they use drugs. Not that this is oh a time of drug escalation. In fact, it wasn't. Right? There are other periods in our history where we've had drug escalation, drug use as escalation and this wasn't one of them so they had to create it so that's the that's the difference at this time right um, I mean you could argue in the 1950s <coughs> Betty Friedan said this was a time of escalation of, of prescription drug abuse right, by right. housewives right so I mean you know depending on what time period you are the 1920s they saw a rise of opium um, in uh, cities in, in uh, but the point is, is that this was a, a conscious strategy yeah. Yeah. that was thought out and implemented at every level, from uh, the the military, the uh, uh, DEA, the um, the president, the um, local law enforcement, the Supreme Court, you name it. Every player is involved, right? And it's and it's it's a web and a strategy that they create to make drugs the issue when it really wasn't. So it's not that there was an increased drug use at that particular time. I, I'd also point out that uh, I believe that uh, Illinois got by with about three prisons through most of the 20th century. Uh, uh, there was Stateville, Menard, <laughs> no. uh, four. Boy, <laughs> I guarantee you. My mom that worked. In I guarantee you that, that <laughs> there's yeah, more than that. Those are new. Over those are new. well over half of the prisons yeah. currently in operation in Illinois were constructed since 1980. That would and be. I mean, not yeah. just not that they were. Money, yeah. I'm talking they were instituted. Yeah. For the first time. Yeah. And I don't know the specifics, but that would be consistent with... Sure. There was an explosion in, in... I mean, there's like 24 prisons or something like that. And, and they're used, if you look at where these prisons are located, 
they're used as job creators in areas of yes, Illinois yeah. where there's no jobs. So you put them in Jacksonville, you put them down in southern Illinois uh -huh. and different places like that where there's no jobs. And so they now, fight for them. Yeah, well, yeah, sure they fight for them. Mm -hmm. They fight like yeah. heck for them. They subsidize, you know, we'll give you the land, we'll run sewers out there and all this stuff because they need the jobs. And on that note, while we were out occupying down in the Capitol, I had some guys come and talk to me, and they were in prison. They had been in prison, one of them for drugs, another one because he got jumped by a group of white bo white men with baseball bats, and he took the bat away from the, and hit him and put him into a coma. Well, what they said to me was, when they got out of prison, they had like he owed like thirty or forty thousand dollars worth of child support. So they're coming out of it. They're using child support as an economic club sure. at this point. Because and then they turn around and say, "Well, it's the person that's incarcerated's fault for not going to court yeah. and getting their child support reduced because they got it. They got arrested." Well, excuse me. I was kind of incarcerated. Right. And they and not only do you have those obligations, but you also then have a whole bunch of new obligations because you have to pay for your mm -hmm. probation officer and your treatment and, all, and your fines and all the things that they um, make you do, you have to pay for them. So now you have this mountain of costs in addition to probably all the loans and things that you defaulted on while you were in prison right. and then if there's child support or whatever obligations. So I mean, you come out and there's no way you're going to be able to get out from under all this. That's another great book that I don't really, uh, didn't really talk about right now, but that she talks about and is not the only one, right? There's this, you know, this call, people are saying, you know, the black communities are, you know, the breakdown and where are the men and why aren't they there being fathers? Well, they're all locked up in prison. <laughs> and, you know, and in the 70s, they incentivized the men out of the homes because right. in the 70s, if you needed food stamps or Section 8, your man couldn't be living with you in order for you to get it. So in the 60s and 70s, they pushed the black men out of the families. And then in the 80s, expect or in the 90s, I guess, expected them to pop back in and be Father Knows Best. Yeah. Only well, they, that they've really. been doing that systematically since the beginning. I mean, they sold them off right. in this, you know, and over and, to this. Right. And oh. black women were employable and black men were not. Because black women could be employable in the homes as, you know, maids. It's a mess. Yeah. Uh -huh. another, yeah. another point we neglected to make here tonight was that uh, when you're in prison, you're not on the unemployment numbers. <laughs> unemployment numbers. Mm -hmm. and, okay. and by by shoving massive numbers into prison, you can right. Further. I would like for you to hypothesize, if you could, if the Occupy 99% folks were, uh, it, were it primarily an African American or a person of color movement, what, um, what would, what would we be facing? <laughs> I mean, in terms of opposition that point, that point from. That was also made about the Tea Party. Or what? Or yeah, you just what? If, what would our what would, would our be, battle cry be? Would we be able to meet would, here, oh, or would right. we be like the Black Panthers in Chicago? Right. I mean, we'd be able to meet here. Yeah, we can meet. But but you know, I think our, I think this movement and 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 I and we're trying very very hard to do outreach um, into poor and uh, neighborhoods into people of color. Um, obviously, we haven't been greatly successful but we're still new I, I anticipate that that we will be able to attract some folks but um, I also think that when we do that then we're going to become under more scrutiny from the just oh. justice system Bring it on. I, I, no I think I think that those, <laughs> I think that the African uh, American community has learned not to stand up because they've been shot down time and time again, and when they go after them, 
They go after them with the big guns. Well, well they haven't learned they've been conditioned. There's a, that's difference. What I mean. There's a difference. Well, that's what I meant. So I meant conditioned. I meant conditioned. Well, but, I would like yeah. to see the movement give some attention to the poor white people, too, because I think that they get kind of swept in the background, and it's okay to call, you know, poor white people trailer trash and they are. shit like that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, this creates more division because... Well, it's, definitely, it's definitely goes beyond just race. Right. Race is obviously a big issue, but it's right. highly socioeconomic. Right. If you were a white white family that grew up in a ghetto after the white flight left, and you were there, to the police officers and anyone else in the city, you know, your skin's as black as right. a black person's skin. They don't care, because now you're lumped in as those are just the poor people. Those are the people, regardless of skin color, we don't care about those people over there. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, Rhyme, in the book I started talking about, The Rich Get Richer and the Poor Get Prison, really focuses on class. That's his issue, yeah, right? Yeah. And Alexander's focusing more on race. But it's obviously both, right? right. And, and, the, and the intersection of the two, you know, the people who are <laughs> poor minorities get it the worst. But, I mean, race and class are obviously included in this. And the other aspect that which she doesn't talk about Michelle doesn't talk about, but um, other uh, criminologists have started to look at is that the percent that the group that's um, rising, uh, the, in terms of the percentage, the highest growth in percentage of prison population are women of color. It's a it's a small number still, but it, they're growing in leaps and bounds in terms of the percentage of, of women of color that are being incarcerated. And I think, you know, a big part of it is they're focusing on, on um, uh, you know, they, it's the, um, the campaign that they're trying to create, which says, well, the reason that we have problems is because these women are unmarried and raising children as the single, fat, you know, head of the household. And we can't have, you know, minority women being heads of households. Stays in the household. Yeah, right. I mean, that would be, you know, so we have to criminalize them as well. Are they, so are they being convicted of drug crimes? Is that, um, and uh, public order crimes, prostitution. Check cashing. Yeah, uh, yeah, minor, oh. minor kinds oh, yeah. of financial crimes. That's how my mom survived. She went out and wrote checks that she didn't have money for and played the, you know, let me be able to get this, whatever we need, and not get, you know, yeah. caught up. Yeah. Right, you get more, you kind of check, you can get a lot more trouble than you still, you know. You steal millions right. from the bank. Right. What is that? It's not a crime. <laughs> How ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. It's like you said, that? you know, you just. I could they... steal a, a thousand people's retirements and leave them, you know, starving. It's around. It happens they every the day. Laws so that it's not a crime. So they That's write the laws right. so they're not a crime. Right. Here. And if you, if you remember his quote from Diamond about where were the regulators. If you look at Congress and you look at, at Phil Graham, who was a U.S. senator from Texas, whose wife was the head of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, and you go back, and Phil Graham was very involved in rewriting some of the, the laws for the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, their, their restrictions, and that's how you ended up with Enron, was because they changed the rules to allow these kind of things to happen. That's how we got the credit credit default swap. That's how we got oh, derivatives. Sure. It was from the Graham Lally Beach Act, Bleach Act, Beach Act and yeah. all that stuff. It's Good old Phil Graham does a great thieving, favor. Thieving. Yeah. yeah. Right. Good Texan. Yeah, right. I know. Texas is good about that, aren't they? Oh, no, I <laughs> Texas wants no rules for the for the rich. Uh, we're going to keep the people. poorest workers and we're going to murder the most people in our prison system. Right. To show how effective we fight crime. Yeah, we beat the, yeah, we, we take yeah. care of crime in Texas. We kill. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it sure has been a deterrent. Yeah. Because there's no more crime. Yeah, there's yeah. no crime in Texas. Right. Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> it's like there's, like there's no, no rape in uh, Iran, right? Yeah. And no homosexuality. No homosexuality in Iran, right. I think it's real interesting if you look, though, how the power structure that we have in this country can 
take a whole group of people and just marginalize them like they've done here. You know, and, and we've seen this historically, you know, in, with all different subgroups of, of cultures. Um, and in Chicago, one of the greatest examples in Chicago was the high rises. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. All the big high rises in Chicago where Daly did not want the African American population <laughs> to influence elections and to do different things. So they put them in these huge high rises. And then, the, the, you know, you had drug problems in there, and you had all, oh, man, you don't go near those places. Because those terrible reasons. people live there. Mm -hmm. You know, and they're fornicating all the time. They've got 10,000 kids, and, you know, and keep them locked up in the high rises. So, in effect, what Daly did was he created a prison system within the city without ever calling it a prison system. Very good, very good. It was. And you gerrymandered them in the high rise. And they, I mean, it leaves them open, to, open yeah. for, sure. yeah. In the 60s and 70s, there were a number of legal people, such as yourself, who had this kind of analysis. And there was a lot of struggle between them as to, well, what do we do with, right. as, as lawyers mm -hmm. with a legal perspective? And, you know, many of them became like movement martyrs almost. Yeah. You know, I was wondering what you see the role of the law or, or people involved with the law in terms of advancing uh, the people's struggle. Pratt Clark answered that question. Say it again. Said Pratt Clark answered that question. Yeah. The next book we read in class after yeah. that Go one. Go ahead. Go ahead. Come on. Oh. Go on. <laughs> okay. Well, Pratt Clark talks about basically how we need to take not a, you know only a multidisciplinary approach, but a transdisciplinary approach. Where not only do different disciplines of academia look at a subject, but they kind of start to intermingle and create their own things, and that, you know that brings out things like critical race theory and critical feminist theory. Um, you know where you seek to deconstruct an issue and find, you know, work your way down until you get to the real root causes. And one of the reasons I really liked uh, this woman, Pratt Clark, was because she, like, the she took that, which, you know, I had heard and read about before, and she said, we can't stop there. We need this social justice model, is what she called it, where we integrate activism with what we know here. You know, and so she advocated, you know, we've got a very dynamic system that's operating on all of these different fronts, and so the confrontation, need, like both the analysis and the confrontation, need to come from multiple fronts. Um, I mean, the only re area where I agreed with her or I disagreed with her majorly was that she's really focused on the legal system can bring about revolutionary change, and I don't necessarily believe that the legal change can be or can have you know a revolutionary radical effect on culture. But I think it's definitely important, and I think that she really, I really liked what she had to say about, you know, we're dealing with these complex, intertwined, very dynamic systems. I mean, we talked about how we went from slavery to, to you know, black codes to Jim Crow to this new mass incarceration. And so we're dealing with these very, very interconnected, dynamic, complex systems, and our analysis and our interaction need to happen on, you know, all of these levels. So we need, you know, we need lawyers and courts being activists and kind of, you know, going out and striking down discriminatory laws, but we also need to be confronting, you know, norms in the street. So, like, in the case of feminism, you know, we need to be attacking patriarchal systems that aren't necessarily upheld by the law. They're upheld by our views of what, uh, you know, a family is in our culture. And so, you know, we need to both use these legal and political, economic, you know, cultural, social, all these different, educational, all these different directions, we need to ha attack the problem because the problem itself doesn't have a single, you know, source. It's spread throughout the whole system. And so because of that, we need to engage the whole system from multiple perspectives. One of the things, like, I, I don't know why, but for some reason I have, like, a, quite a few lawyer friends on Facebook. And what I get from them is that going to law school, it sets you up into a cycle where because of the amount of debt that you have to come into, then you have to go to work to pay off that debt. And it's so high that it puts you in a, it 
sexopath for you. Mm -hmm. So you can't really do a lot of activism because you have to work so hard to get sure. what pay off the school and to make your living that it puts you in this machine that it, it sort of like takes that like off the table for you. Well, it's the... It's the professors who are doing the legal activism, who are, you know, going in and spending, you know, decades deconstructing a single issue yeah, from multiple directions. But the problem is, is that in the past, the professors have kind of, they've written the book, and we're good. But what, why I really like Pratt Clark is, you know, she said, we need to take what's in this book and apply it practically to real life. And there will obviously be parts that fail you know, or that don't live up to what they're doing, but, you know, we rework it as we go, but, you know, I really liked her social justice model where, you know, we need activism to take what the academics have given us as far as deconstruction of the ideas and then apply it out into the world, and, you know, we may find out some of it's completely wrong, Yeah, well, you know, I, but I say to my friend, we never know if we don't try. I say to my, friend, I say to my lawyer friends, you've got... The, we got a critical a race department that told feminism us in that education. torture was legal. Yeah. That happened because law professors who believe that taught them that. Yeah. And it has to be like like he said, it's like a decade long switch into another logic of thinking. And it's like, you know, getting blood out of a turnip. Is, is that sort of like the like the Innocence Project, the thing that Barry Sheck is doing, where you're taking multiple um, disciplines and applying it to you know a an issue, which I think is just you know really a way a way you have to go. I too, ha I was going to go to law school when I couldn't be a nurse anymore, and a friend of mine who was a lawyer said they'll kill your spirit. Don't yeah, go yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, well, now. <laughs> well, you're, you're a you professor. Did. You're I'm a lawyer also. Yeah. So, <laughs> do you have a practice? Do you have a practice? I, I practice.